you can't sue the producer of a toxic chemical until science on that chemical and that particular association and the particular harm reaches a certain threshold. Welcome to The Doctor's Pharmacy. I'm Dr. Mark Hyman, and that's pharmacy with an F, a place for conversations that matter. And if you're concerned about chemicals in our food, particularly glyphosate or weed killer called Roundup, which is on 70% of our food and has been linked to cancer and microbiome issues and lots more health concerns, then this podcast is going to matter to you because it's with my friend and activist lawyer, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who's an extraordinary guy. We've known each other for many years. We've traveled the world together. We've kayaked and rafted in Peru, in Chile. We've gone through many adventures, uh, near-death experiences, uh, and it's just been a pleasure knowing Bobby because not only is he an activist, leader, environmentalist, but he's also a heck of a lot of fun. So Bobby serves as the president of Waterkeeper Alliance. He's the chairman of the board and chief legal counsel for the Children's Health Defense and of counsel to Morgan & Morgan, which is a nationwide personal injury practice. He was the chief prosecuting attorney for Hudson Riverkeeper. And and when he was involved with the Hudson River Keepers, he helped hold General Electric accountable and had over a billion dollar settlement to make them clean up the Hudson River from all the PCBs they dumped in there. He's a defender of the environment and children's health, and he's had many, many successful legal actions. He was named one of Time Magazine's Heroes for the Planet for his success in helping Riverkeeper lead the fight to restore Hudson River. This group's achievement has helped spawn 300 waterkeeper organizations around the globe. He also uh, was a co-host of Ring of Fire on Air America Radio. I was on that show once. He served as a distant district attorney in New York City. He's worked on environmental issues across America and has helped many indigenous tribes in Latin America and Canada negotiate treaties protecting traditional homelands. He's credited with leading the fight to protect New York City's water supply and has done so much good in the world. He wrote a number of great best-selling books, including Crimes Against Nature. He went to Harvard Law School. He graduated from the London School of Economics and got his law degree from the University of Virginia Law School. Uh, and it's just an extraordinary man. Welcome to the Doctor's Pharmacy, Bobby. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for having me. Okay, so I want to just sort of give people a little bit of a background on glyphosate because uh, you know I recently wrote my book Food Fix, which talks a lot about the farm system, what's wrong with it, and glyphosate is really at the center of that conversation because it is a weed killer that's used on farms to prevent weeds growth, particularly around GMO soy crops and many other crops. Uh, It's incredible blockbuster uh, chemical from agriculture. It's been um, used uh, all over the world. In fact, uh, according to the EPA, 220 million pounds of Roundup, which is is glyphosate, uh, were used just in 2015. In California alone, there's more than 10 million pounds used every year. It's the world's most commonly used herbicide. Accounts for 72% of all pesticides and agricultural chemicals around the world. Uh, And since 1974, we've put on 1.6 billion kilograms, more than 3.5 billion pounds on crops in the United States alone. It's on 70 different food crops, including corn, soy, canola, wheat. So if you eat a slice of bread, a bowl of Cheerios, a sushi roll, a plate of pasta, slice of pizza, a chicken nugget, there's a good chance one or more of its ingredients was doused in Roundup or weed killer before it left the farm. In fact, you know, uh, Cheerios have more glyphosate per serving than vitamin D and vitamin B12, which are added to enrich the cereal. Uh, It's even been in commercial honey. So it's a big problem. It's linked to cancer. It's linked to all these health issues. So Bobby, take us back to, you know, the origins of glyphosate and, 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 and how it's become such a prevalent chemical and why it's so bad for us. Well, you mentioned the Hudson River and my work on the Hudson River, and my first case on the Hudson was getting, as you said, General Electric's PCBs out of the Hudson. The manufacturer of those PCBs was Monsanto. And I told, and I've had That's so right. many That's cases right. against Monsanto over the years. I told Mike Papantonio, who did the radio show with me, and who was my law partner for many years, some really, really big cases, including the dark with a case that Mark Ruffalo just made the movie about dark water, which um, my pap and I represented uh, about four thousand people and a, nut and a team of attorneys who um, had been poisoned by C eight, 
which is the active ingredient for Teflon, oh. which DuPont had discharged from his plan in Parkersburg, West Virginia, and poisoned the entire community, knew it, and kept it a secret from everybody. Wow. Um, but anyway, I, I told Pap at one point, because we were talking about all my different involvements with Monsanto, and I said, if my life were a Superman comic, Monsanto <laughs> would be Lex Luthor. I, I feel like I've been struggling against them my whole life. Um, and my first consciousness of Monsanto was when I was a little boy, because I met Rachel Carson when I was oh, you a did. kid. Uh, and she came to my house at Hickory For those Hill. who don't know, who, who was Rachel Carson? Rachel Carson was probably the, um, you know, most people would say she was the central figure in the environmental movement and as the kind of founder of, of modern environmentalism. She wrote a, wrote a book. She was an extraordinary woman. She was a brilliant marine biologist. She wrote a whole series of New York Times bestsellers that broke, every one of them broke records for um, the length of time on the New York Times bestseller list. She was not only a very gifted marine biologist, and interestingly, she was from, I think, Reading, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. um, and she never saw the ocean until she was 22 years old. Wow. But she was, you know, she was 180 IQ, and she was a brilliant writer and a brilliant communicator, and had this, you know, this gift of empathy for all creatures. And, she wrote Silent uh, Spring, which was sort of the and she wrote Silent Spring, and Silent Spring moment. was a really important book because up until she wrote that book, nobody did not believe that the chemical industry was. Um, was what it pretended to be, which was this huge um, boon to American prosperity. Better living through chemistry, better right? Better living. <laughs> it was, uh, it had, you know, it had helped us win the war against fascism, and now it was going to help us, it was going to allow us to win the war against the insects and create free food, abundant food for everybody. And mm. um, she wrote a book, that for the first time disclosed to Americans in very, very clear language with very well-sourced science, the price we were paying for that temporary cheap food solution yeah. was actually imposing enormous costs that if we had known about them, we would have never taken the deal, not only to human health, but that, you know, the, the term silent spring indicated that it was gonna eliminate you know, the birds and the insects and, and things that a lot of people didn't think that we really cared about that much, but she showed us why we should care about it. And in fact, it was a very prescient book. About 90% of birds, songbirds in America have disappeared. Since 90%? Wrote, uh, since she wrote that book. Um, we're living in a very different world today than I grew up in and, and you grew up in. Yeah. She was attacked viciously by Monsanto, and a lot of people, you know, look looked at what Monsanto did during the um, during the Roundup cases, which I was just on that legal team, and they said that they Monsanto took the blueprint from the tobacco industry, but mm -hmm. Monsanto really was the company that created that that um, that blueprint. Or how do you deal? How do you quash dissent? Yeah against your product and you know the tobacco industry did it very masterfully for yeah. 60 years by manipulating science and creating doubt and they were able to escape any regulation of a product that was killing one out of every four of its customers who use that product as directed cigarettes <laughs> yeah, so but monsanto really was the mastermind for that those techniques mm. um and they they hired Hill and Knowlton and Edelman, and they, you know, they created these PR firms that really, from the ground up, went out to lie to the public to to hire these phony scientists. We call them biostitutes. <laughs> biostitutes. That's good. You know, to generate tobacco science, junk science, just to sow doubt. Yeah, that's what the and food industry was, does too. And that was their, um, you know, that was their strategy. But when Rachel Carson published this book, and it was published in serial form in the New Yorker magazine, and then it went on to, you know, then the book was consolidated, and I think 
it was it stayed for many many months on the bestseller list i believe i remember 62 weeks or something mm. that it was number one on the bestseller list mm. and and that could be wrong but i think that that could that's right um they mounted a very very concerted and deliberative attack against her they sent these white coated lab scientists and medical doctors every community in the country to lecture um, about the benefits of pesticides and how, you know, Rachel Carson was crazy. Yeah. And they they went out and they found um, third party uh, uh, front groups mm -hmm. with integrity, you know, the institutions in our society who they would secretly co-opt with payoffs, et cetera, who then go out and act on their behalf without their fingerprints on yeah. it. And they got the American Medical Association mm. to condemn Rachel Carson. They got Time Magazine, Life Magazine, Sports wow. Illustrated, wow. the American Garden Clubs, all of them to attack uh, Carson. And if you read the contemporary critiques of her at that time they almost all use the same language and mm. they often attack her very personally they um you'll you'll read that she's a spinster which yeah. was the modern you know the contemporary euphemism for lesbian oh no so they're really trying to discredit her and she never defended herself she was dying of cancer huh. at the time but i'm very proud that my uncle president kennedy stepped in and he defied his own USDA, his Department of Agriculture, mm. which was it had already been captured. It was a captured agency. It was all bought and owned by Monsanto, even at that early date. The really? food industry owned the USDA, and you know that's a huge problem it today. Is, yeah. And um, and they were attacking her, and he had to go against them. He created an independent. He got Jerome Wisner, who was his chief science advisor, to put together a panel of uh, scientists with impeccable credentials, to go through every important or relevant material assertion in her book hmm. and to validate the science. And they came back and they absolutely vindicated Carson. And um, But at the time that I met her, when she visited Hickory Hill, she was under attack. Yeah. Um, President Kennedy's vindication of her ended up um, being an important part in planting the seeds for Earth Day, which happened seven years later. Mm -hmm. First Earth Day in the passage of Five for the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act in 1973 in the ban that year of, um, of DDT. Yeah. So... EDT had, you know, wiped out a peregrine falcon, which had gone extinct in the on the East Coast, and of course, it was causing health impacts that people didn't know how to assess or evaluate. Yeah, on humans, right? And Monsanto, it was the flagship product for Monsanto. So mm. the loss of that product, which was the biggest pesticide in the world at that time, was something that they had to quickly repair. And they found at that time a um, a tank scalant which is a chemical that was used to remove metals and accretions of calcium and other compounds from the inside of metal tanks. That was glyphosate, and that's why it had been developed. But at some point in glyphosate's history, somebody had thrown a bucket of it out in the lawn and noticed that it killed everything. <laughs> and Monsanto took a look at that and said, we can make an herbicide of that. During the first decade of its use, it was a conventional herbicide. Farm workers would strap a tank of glyphosate onto their backs, and they would go through the cornfields. Yeah. In the early days, right after the planting, when the mm. weeds were the same side, were competing with the corn um, saplings, and they would spray the weeds and kill the weeds to give the corn time to grow high enough so the weeds could no longer compete. Yeah. The spraying took place very, very early in the season before there was any food on that plant. Yeah. And then in um, 2000, or in 1994, 
And Monsanto or glyphosate did not, was not a particularly noteworthy herbicide at that time. It had many, many competitors in the marketplace. And then something changed in 1994, which was that Monsanto introduced Roundup Ready corn. And what had happened is they were, they would spray, some, they were dumping um, the, the uh, they were dumping the glyphosate or the Roundup out in the grass. At one point, they noticed that there was a weed that was not being killed. Mm. And they said, let's, that, that weed is immune to glyphosate. glyphosate. Yeah. Let's take a gene out of that weed and put it in corn mm. and make the corn immune to glyphosate. And that was really the first big GMO crop. Yeah. And, um, and now you could fire all those farm workers and you could fly an airplane spraying pesticides and saturate the entire landscape with just one guy. Yeah. And everything would die except for the round of ready corn. Yeah. And it changed the face of agriculture across the planet. Mm. Within a few years, most of the corn was Roundup Ready corn. Virtually all corn grown today is, you know, 95, 98% of it is Roundup Ready corn. It's, um, it's uh, Roundup, it's Monsanto's corn. Yeah. They sell the seeds and they it's sell the seed. herbicides. It's a, it's a closed circuit. It's a closed I mean, circuit. And they also implant in the seed, they've done other genetic manipulations that allow, that, that, creates a plant that reflects the sunlight certain spectrums of light so you can actually fly a plane over the cornfields with a special camera which is what Monsanto does they can photograph and they can know from the air which are roundup which are roundup ready corn and which corn is a natural corn and they have a list of all the people who have paid for their corn if you're a farmer and you happen to have their crop on your property and you haven't paid for it, then they sue you. And that's, that's right. you know, one of the things that makes them very notorious. Those lawsuits against individual farmers, a lot of times they've they've got roundup corn on their property because of drift. Because, yeah. you know, the corn drifted onto their property, but it's not what they bought. Wait, wait, just to, to recap that, that's important. So basically what happens because of wind, there's a farmer who has regular natural corn and a farmer who has roundup ready corn and it drifts over to their farm and it starts growing and then Monsanto sues them because right. they're growing their, their genetically- Their seeds have become pollinated their by patented Roundup seeds. Ready. Right, by the patented seeds have have fertilized the seeds, the natural seeds, the heritage you know, corn of a, the farmer. So the next year he's got Roundup Ready corn or, or a large part of it on his property and then they sue him and make mm. him pay for it. Wow. So, um, so not only are they and, poisoning farmers, they're trying to make them yeah. bankrupt. <laughs> and then, um, and then something happened in two thousand six. So by so between nineteen ninety four and two thousand six, Roundup Ready corn, GMO corn, and then they developed soy and sorghum, and you know, barley. everything was Roundup Ready. Yeah, everything except for <laughs> canola. Wheat. Everything except for wheat. And then in 2006, they discovered that Roundup was a desiccant. So that, and what that means, if you spray it on a crop, it will actually dry out the crop. And one of the big enemies of the farmer is that if there's rain around the time of harvest, their crops can get wet and then they get moldy and then it ruins the entire silo. Yeah. And so what um, what Monsanto did is they began telling farmers, spray this on the crop, on your wheat, right before harvest or at the yeah. time of harvest. And it was so popular that about 85% of the Roundup that has been used in history has been used since 2006. Wow. And a large part of that is as a desiccant. And what that meant, Mark, is for the first time they're spraying it on food. Yeah. Right at harvest. Yeah. And for the first Not time. Not early in the season when it right. may have a chance to wash off, but actually just before you're going to eat it. <laughs> right. And they're spraying it for the first time on wheat because there was no such thing as Roundup Ready wheat. Yeah. They started spraying it on wheat as a desiccant. 
And so 2006 marks the date when suddenly these gluten allergies began exploding. And the celiac disease and all these kind of wheat problems that oh, we started seeing in this yeah. country. If you measure back and say, when did it start? You can look and draw a red line and it's 2006 and it's the, the year that they began spraying it on wheat. What happened is after And we'll that, get into why that is in a minute. What? We'll get into why that is in a minute. We can explain the, the yeah. mechanism. So, um, so in order to bring, and, and we know that Roundup is associated with all kinds of illnesses, mm -hmm. right? With, um, with gluten allergies, with celiac disease, with definitely with um, non-alcoholic fatty liver cancer, um, with colon cancers, with uh, kidney cancers, and with many, many other problems. Mm -hmm. But you can't sue somebody. You can't sue the producer of a toxic chemical until science on that chemical and that particular association and the particular harm reaches a certain threshold. Yeah. And that's called Daubert. It's a federal rule, and most of the states have rules that follow Daubert. And what, it, what Daubert says is the purpose of Daubert is they don't want somebody coming in and going to a jury and saying, uh, um, you know, um, uh, uh, that um, uh, this perfume made me uh, insane. Right, 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 right. right. Because they, they, they want to make sure that there's enough science that you can't just bring a weird theory or a marginal theory into so it's court a level of evidence that, to the jury right. and have the jury decide on that. So yeah. the judge has to say that the science on this is actually mainstream enough. It has passed this threshold that I'm going to allow you to, to explain this to the jury. Yeah. And so we couldn't sue Monsanto, even though we all knew it's causing all these problems. We couldn't sue them on it until 2015. Because in 2015, the IARC, which is the International Agency for Research in Cancer. I just stop for a second and tell you who IARC yeah. is. IARC is an agency back in the, I think it was the 70s. People realized that, that a lot of things were carcinogenic. They were increasing your risk of cancer. And the different countries were regulating them all differently. And they were regulating them different um, different substances and yeah. different compounds and different elements, and they were regulating them with varying degrees of good science. So the major Western countries said, you know, none of us really has the capacity to, to get around up all the science in the world and the best scientists and figure out what's carcinogenic and what isn't. So let's create all of us together and that's part of the WHO, is that right? Yeah, and we'll create an agency and they ended up headquartering it in France. And every year it looks at certain associations, at certain um, vectors, for example, it might look at coffee one year, it might look at cell phones one year, it might look at, um, uh, uh, um, you know, PCBs yeah. or whatever, or tetrachloroethylene or polyaromatic hydrocarbons or any compound and it will bring in the best scientists in the world in that area from every country in the world and it will assemble all of the literature on that association and it will have them read all of that literature there may be a thousand studies mm. and then make a determination about whether it's a definite carcinogen whether it's a pro probable carcinogen a possible carcinogen in both, or not a carcinogen, in both animals and, and human, human beings. Yeah. So it looks at the animal studies separately and it looks at the human studies separately, recognizing that just because something causes animal cancer in animals, yeah, it's not necessarily a problem. It doesn't necessarily cause in humans. And in order to make the determination that it's a probable carcinogen in humans, you need both the animal studies, you need the mechanistic studies, like petri dishes, etc., and then you need the um, you need the epidemiological studies, which are the mm -hmm. human population studies. 
And it takes a lot of science to get to the point where IARC will say that's a probable carcinogen. And that happened in 2015. For glyphosate. For glyphosate, but with only one association, with which, which was non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh-huh. Oh, even though we have a pretty good idea it's causing many, 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 many other problems. Yes. Um, and there's really strong science on those other problems. None of them had to hit the threshold or we could take it to a jury. And just because IARC says it is not enough, the judge has to make an independent determination. Now, even though you know the agencies all over the world take what IARC say is gospel, for example, in California, there's a law called Prop 65, which says that anything that's carcinogenic has to be labeled as such at, yeah. the, at the place where you purchase it. And the way they determine what is carcinogenic, what it isn't, is what IARC says. So if yeah. IARC says something's a probable carcinogen, it has to be labeled in California. And there are at least 10 nations and probably 50 jurisdictions around the world that do the same thing, that say whatever IARC says, you know, that They just go with the their law. word. Yeah. And, but still, the judges in this country are not allowed to say whatever IARC says passes to Albert. They have to make an independent determination. Hi, everyone. Hope you're enjoying the episode. Before we continue, we have a quick message from Dr. Mark Hyman about his new company, Pharmacy, and their first product, the 10-Day Reset. Hey, it's Dr. Hyman. Do you have FLC? What's FLC? It's when you feel like crap. It's a problem that so many people suffer from and often have no idea that it's not normal or that you can fix it. I mean, you know the feeling. It's when you're super sluggish, your digestion's off, you can't think clearly, or you have brain fog, or you just feel run down. Can you relate? I know most people can. But the real question is, what the heck do we do about it? Well, I hate to break the news, but there's no magic bullet. FLC isn't caused by one single thing, so there's not one single solution. However, there is a systems-based approach, a way to tackle the multiple root factors that contribute to FLC, and I call that system the 10-day reset. The 10-Day Reset combines food, key lifestyle habits, and targeted supplements to address FLC straight on. It's a protocol that I've used with thousands of my community members to help them get their health back on track. It's not a magic bullet. It's not a quick fix. It's a system that works. If you want to learn more and get your health back on track, click on the button below or visit GetPharmacy.com. That's GetPharmacy with an F, F F-A-R-M-A-C-Y.com. Now back to this week's episode. Once we got that decision from IARC, a couple of firms, you know, mainly Bob Hedlund, here in Los Angeles, another firm called the Miller Firm in, um, in Virginia, and Morgan and & Morgan and Weiss Luxembourg um, filed suits, and they began collecting cases and advertising for them. Mm. And so two years ago, we had about 14,000 cases. There yeah. were six firms. And um, Tom Hedlund had about 1,400, and we filed on a lot of suits. Now, were these all individuals who had glyphosate exposure and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma or other things? Only for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. They had to have non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and they had to have a strong evidence that it was that they had a long-term exposure to glyphosate. Hmm. And then we chose our first, um, I mean, this is actually a very cool story. If you want to hear it, the first case, um, you know, when you when you bring these cases, they're called mass tort litigation. It's not a class action suit. Each case is treated different separately, and you try each one individually. So there'll literally be 14,000 different so cases. So we would have 14,000 <laughs> trials, but what wow. happens in practice is after you have tried about six or eight of those cases, everybody kind of knows what the case is worth. And the company will then come and settle because having all those outstanding cases, it's just, it creates so much uncertainty well, they don't want to deal with it. And this is a huge impact because Bayer stock, which bought Monsanto, not a very well, good well, idea. Well, let me tell you what happened. We, we brought this case, and it, it's kind of an interesting story because at the beginning... The, the six firms were all working together, and we had to decide strategically where should we bring the first case, and um, which case should we bring. Yeah, what's the best case to get a, a good judgment? And, and so, and, I'll, and 
there's another complication because the firm that wins that contest is the firm that gets the biggest payoff from that case because he owns the case. Yeah. We're all going to work on it. <clears throat> um, but Mike Miller's firm kind of won the contest. He had sharp elbows and he had a really good argument that Dwayne Johnson's case was a really important case. And Dwayne Johnson was the first case that was tried. For yeah. Glad to say it was like and a twin. Dwayne Johnson was a um, was an African American high school groundskeeper, and part of his job had been spraying glyphosate on the you know to control vegetation around the school. As it turned out, he had a backpack um, dispenser, a tank that was leaking all the time, and sometimes it would cover his whole body. It would kind of explode, and, and he would be covered with glyphosate, but he wasn't worried about it because it said on the label that it's safe as aspirin, and it, and it had a picture of a guy <clears throat> spraying it with no protective gear. Well, aspirin kills about 40,000 people a year. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so maybe he's right. <laughs> So he, he um, and he, but he got worried because, you know, you know non Hodgkin's lymphoma is like autoimmune disease. It can attack any organ in your body. And his sister him, had it that. His skin. Yeah. And his skin, he was discovered it was fatal. And he had, he hasn't died yet, but he was, even when we brought the case, his doctors were saying he had three months to live. He, his body was covered with these really, he was a very, very handsome man. Mm. And he had a very happy marriage and wonderful wife and wonderful kids. And his body was covered with postulating lesions. He couldn't know, he loved swimming, but he could no longer swim because he would, it would gross other people out, you know, who were using a swimming pool. So it really destroyed his life in so many ways and, mm. and took his life, or it was, you know, it was destined to take his life. And he was a very good plaintiff and had, you know, the exposure was very clear. Mike Miller was supposed to bring the case, and he's a Virginia law firm, but about two weeks before we were gonna bring the case to trial, Mike Miller, who's my age, was 66, was injured in a kite surfing accident wow. off of Cape Hatteras. Um, he rigged the kite wrong upside down and it lifted him up and slammed him against the pier and it broke his back, broke a lot of ribs. And he called us from the hospital and said, you know, we're gonna go forward with the case, but you guys, your firm, which is Bob Hedlund, needs to step up and take a bigger responsibility because, you know, he couldn't be there. Yeah, And he assigned his his partner, Tim Litzenberg, to be to lead the case. And about a week later, we were on the phone with our firm was on the phone, or Bob Hedlund was on the phone with um, Tim Litzenberg, and he had a grand mal seizure while he was on the phone strategizing about the case. And it turned out that Bob Hedlund really had to take the lead in the case. Yeah. Now, I think it was a lucky thing because um, the it was a kid at Bob Hedlund who'd been working on this case for two years named. Um, Brent Wisner, and he's a brilliant attorney. He looks kind of like Jonah Hill. Uh huh. <laughs> and he has just a, a genius mind and incre extraordinary um, capacity to communicate with the jury. Um, mm. He is unflappable. He had total command over the science and a real, and, and that a very, very unusual ability to be able to trans to translate very complex scientific concepts to people who may not even have a high school education. Yeah, could get. And the first case we had was in uh, San Francisco. Mm -hmm. We had that trial, um, and he asked the jury in the end for 300 million. We were saying, Brent, you can't ask him for that much. Because, you know, that's a big strategic consideration at the end of a trial. Yeah. How much you ask, because if you ask too much, the jury, well, it's a max of overreaching and the jury may punish you. Right. And he said, I'm going to ask for 300 million. He asked for it. They gave him 289 million. It was a very highly educated jury. We had a couple of working scientists on that jury and it's other people who were very, you know, all college educated, many advanced degrees. We did the next trial, Amy Wagstaff, tried the next trial in federal court in San Francisco, and we 
expected that we would, could lose that case. We had a judge who was very hostile to her, and um, we did, we couldn't read the jury very well. We won eighty nine million in that. That was two and a half months later. The third trial we tried in Oakland, and at the end of that trial, Brent. Um, we had that meeting the night before the closing argument, and Brent said, I'm going to ask him for a billion dollars. And we said, no, you can't do it. <laughs> he went ahead and did it. They came back with the $2 billion judgment. $2 now, billion. What, dollars. Uh, and what you were saying about the impact on Bayer, so when we were picking a jury in the first case, in the Dwayne Johnson case, um, Monsanto and one of the most brilliant uh, corporate maneuvers in history sold itself to Bear yeah. for $63 billion. And we were already picking a jury. Right. This was, was this, this was an after the cases were tried, right? Or This was when we were picking a jury on the first case. Really? The transaction. Why would, why would they want to do that? Crazy. I don't know. Um, and then they, um, they, you know, I think Monsanto, I don't know what Monsanto told them, but clearly Monsanto must have told them that they were going to win the case. I mean, their stock price went down $34 well, billion. It went dollars. down after the first case, it dropped 17%. In the second case, it dropped, Bears share price dropped 30%, and then it dropped ultimately 50% in the third case. And it's hovered between 30 and uh, 50, but I saw a couple of weeks ago, uh, I saw that um, the Wall Street analysts were evaluating Bear's total value as a company at $63 billion, which is the price that they paid for Monsanto. It's crazy, so and they the, just fired the, the CEO. Entire, the board just fired the CEO of Bear, well, right? Yeah, the, the chair. Um, but, but Bear's value today is the same price that they paid, paid for, for Monsanto. Monsanto. So the entire value of Monsanto has been completely erased. Wow. Which is, to me, a, you know, justice. Yeah. That but company was a bad company. That's, they brought us company. Agent Orange, DDT, PCBs, Dioxin, and Glyphosate. Yeah, also, uh, <laughs> um, they bought Searle. And, uh, um, Which is a pharmaceutical company. Yeah, but but it, 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 they owned a sugar substitute. Mm-hmm. Nutrisweet. No, the other one. Aspartame, no. Aspartame. Yeah. Which is, they, they had a niche in... Um, finding all the bad chemicals and, and selling really them really well. <laughs> that nobody else wanted to touch. And that was Monsanto. And then they had, you know, they had a corporate culture that was like a cowboy, a, you know, black hat. Back. Well, their, their motto is essentially, we need this type of agriculture to feed the world. I know people right. have been in Monsanto and their mantra is, we need to feed the world. We need GMO seeds. We need these herbicizing chemicals in order to feed the world. And that just isn't true. When you look at the data, it's really clear that you can grow as much food or more food better food without all those chemicals, without those seeds. And this right. has been demonstrated all over the world. And like in Europe, there's been incredible studies where they, they don't allow GMO foods there. And you can look at the amount of pesticides and herbicides they use is far less. And the yields are no worse. In fact, maybe Plus better. the soils are just far better. And they're more absorbing carbon. And, you know, the soils are the biggest carbon sink. Yeah. And we've destroyed that using glyphosate, and then you know, of course, you look at um, you, know, you look at the insects and what's happened to the, the biodiversity insect life and the amphibians and everything, and we don't know which of the pesticides particularly, but clearly glyphosate is eliminating. You know, there's 13 that we know are being exterminated, extirpated from the planet. So glyphosate also kills the insects. It either kills them directly or it interferes with the shikame um, pathway. Or so what is destroys, that, Bobby? What it, what is or it? it's, it's part of the microbiome. It's the way that the microbiome essentially communicates with itself. And, you know, one of the things that, that Monsanto said from the beginning is that um, glyphosate is safe because it doesn't 
interfere with any human system or organ. Uh, but that was before we understood the importance of the microbiome, which yeah. is actually our largest and probably our most important organ. I mean, you know, the brain is important, yeah. the heart is important, but the microbiome is the largest organ. And it and without the chicken pathway, it, it simply doesn't function. So, so this is something I don't think people realize. I mean, yes, they've heard of the cancer glyphosate connection, but people don't understand that glyphosate is toxic to the microbiome. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you know, it's it, small amounts can have a big impact. Yeah. And just, just for example, the Impossible Burger, which is a GMO soy burger, has a hundred and time, ten times the amount of glyphosate that's needed to destroy your microbiome in animal studies. And and we're seeing, like you said, increases in celiac expression because thirty five percent of people have the celiac gene, but not everybody gets it. One percent usually get it, but the rate of celiac has gone up 400% in the last 50 years, and the rate of gluten sensitivity has gone dramatically up, and it's because, in part, perhaps, because it's destroying our microbiome, and we get changes in the gut floor, which lead to leaky gut, and then the gluten starts to create problems. So how, how, how does a, the glyphosate interact with um, in the soil? Because you just mentioned soil and being a carbon sink, and, 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 uh, and we've talked a lot about this in podcasts, the importance of soil for helping sequester carbon and reverse climate change. How does it affect the soil microbiome? It destroys the soil biome. And because of that, it makes the soil kind of impervious. The soil is no longer, it cuts off the relationship between the soil and the atmosphere and um, and it seals the soil off so it no longer acts as a carbon sink. Yeah, I mean, you've got, you've got the microbiome in your gut, but you've also got the microbiome in the soil. Right. And that is what makes soil work. It's what allows the plants to extract the nutrients. It allows it to hold carbon that actually sucks the yeah. carbon and, and holds water. Yeah, and glyphosate basically turns soil into dirt. So yeah. It's, uh, it, so, so, it's lifeless. So what, what what's next in this whole glyphosate story? Because you're in the center of it. You've tried these cases. There's more cases coming. And, you know, you're, you're recently the EPA announced that glyphosate was safe which seems preposterous given all this science. What's gonna happen next? During the trial, um, we got a hold through discovery of communications um, from the White House that showed that President Trump had sent during the trial a message to um, to the uh, leadership of Monsanto saying, we have got your back. And that basically is the way that EPA has been behaving. But, you know, the, the thing that is that EPA, even before Trump, was utterly captured and utterly corrupt. The pesticide division um, was working hand-in-hand hand with Monsanto for many years. There is a, um, a guy who ran the— It was also a revolving door of people It was who a revolving door, but even FDA more than that, and... they had a guy in there called Jess Rowland who was running the pesticide division— who was communicating inside information to Monsanto. And in fact, when the, another federal agency, um, the Agency for Healthcare Research, um, oh no, it was the ATSDR, um, the Agency for Toxic Substance Review, had uh, decided to do its own tests for the National Toxicity Program, it's tests of the toxicity of Monsanto, of, of glyphosate, glyphosate and yeah. Roundup. Roundup's actually much more toxic than glyphosate. Yeah. As Roundup is the formulated product which has these adjuvants in it, which makes glyphosate, which, which amplify the toxicity. And you can buy that for your lawn, right? <laughs> right, you can buy it for your lawn. And the... Um, they had a guy called Jess Rollin, who was the head of the pesticide division, who sent a note to Monsanto saying, I'm gonna kill this study by the ATSDR. I'm gonna pressure them to kill the study, and when I do that, you guys need to give me a medal. So we had that email. Wow. And the judge wouldn't let us show the email to the jury. Why? You know, they, the judges are funny, they don't, um, you know, we thought it was relevant, but the judge thought maybe it was too prejudicial. <laughs> well, and, it was. Huh? Yeah, it was. It was incriminating. They should have seen it. But anyway, they still gave us $2 billion because of all the other stuff. Oh. 
Well, that's the reason they gave him $2 billion is because we had reams of that kind of material, these secret communications that show that Monsanto was running EPA. And they were telling EPA, they all knew that that Roundup was causing cancer, and they were working together to hide it from the public, to derail TAS, to discredit TAS, to take the mice out of TAS that were, you know, getting uh, sick, uh, that were getting kidney tumors, and you know, and to do all, all of these really deceptive, falsified science, fraudulent science. So these big, big food and ad companies are terrified of lawsuits and because of discovery, where yeah. you can get all this information right. from emails and communications and. Uh, you know, there was a, a bill introduced into Congress a number of years ago called the Cheeseburger Bill, euphemistically, which prohibited lawsuits against food companies for obesity. And uh, it was passed in the Congress. It was defeated in the, in the Senate. But then they found out a way to get it in states all over the country, which prohibits people from suing fast yeah. food companies, which, which they're terrified of because of exactly what you're talking about. And I think it's such an important thing for yeah, people to Yeah, they don't want to win the lawsuits. They want to make sure you can't bring the lawsuits. Exactly. And now you did, and you're discovering all this dirty laundry that is the intersection of where big ag and the government have been colluding to suppress information that's hurting the public. And, and it's kind of shocking. I mean, even for me to hear it, the, the level of the 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 relationships the revolving door between Monsanto executives the EPA the USDA the FDA is kind of terrifying right yeah and what what are the kinds of things that you found in that discovery that were sort of surprising that that, that kind of illustrate that that way in which our government's co-opted by the well, the it's just chemical the manipulation companies. of the of the science i mean at one point so they knew it was cancerous very early on yes from the beginning they knew it was cancerous and the way that they would let, in, in fact, EPA originally said it's an it's initial licensing for Roundup said it is a carcinogen, and it um, and they based that on a um, on a study on a, a mouse study where the the I think I don't know seventy or eighty percent of the mice got kidney tumors. And you had another. They brought it on a. a Monsanto, and we got all of these internal documents from the Monsanto that show they were going to pay this scientist a huge amount of money to come in and dispute those findings. And the EPA let them reopen the at, in test, and he came <coughs> in and claimed that he found tumors in the control groups, but mm -hmm. he never showed those tumors to anybody. Mm -hmm. They threw out the study. And they said, and but Monsanto had to promise to redo the study. And in 40 years, they've never redone it. So the whole thing was based on fraud from the outset. And it was, as you say, it was EPA acting as a sock puppet for the industry that it was supposed to regulate. The EPA had completely been co-opted. And for all those years, was colluding directly, and it was extraordinary, really, the the control that Monsanto had over the pesticide division, where they had their own guy running that division for within you know, the government, within the government, running EPA's pesticide division and making sure <coughs> not only that the pesticide division did not regulate Monsanto, but that no other agency and the government was allowed to look at them. He would go out and kill studies by other agencies. And there were no whistleblowers from the agency, whether it was Republican or Democratic presidents? Well, you know, there are periodically a, whistleblowers, but... Um, but you think, you know, maybe the Clinton administration, Obama administration might have sort of dealt with this, but why Why wouldn't they? Are they scared uh, of the Monsanto? Or are they... You know, the, the agency capture is pervasive. And um, that's an important sentence. Agency yeah. capture is pervasive, and that is exactly true in every aspect of the government, including yeah. and especially the and, food and industry. And it's not just revolving doors. There's a, there's there are a million different little ways that agency capture occurs, and you know, and it's not even you know. Oftentimes, you'll see high level officials, high level officers from. You know, polluting corporations are brought in to run the agency or lobbyists. But even more than that, people who work for those agencies, first of all, the budgets of the agencies are controlled by governmental committees. 
and the committees, like the pesticide committees and the health committees, the, the, the companies, the industry knows that those committees have to be controlled. In Congress. In Congress, because they write the budget for the agency, so they have tremendous control over what the agency does and does not do. Mm -hmm. And so they will work very hard to make sure that they control the chairman of those congressional committees who have oversight over the agencies. And then, you know, that's a way to to engineer agency capture. The other thing is... Yeah, I mean, almost 100% of the ag committees in the House and Senate are highly funded, and the members are highly funded by right. And companies if you like look Monsanto at the ag, and their campaigns. For example, yeah. the agricultural committees, the chair of those committees will always be the biggest receiver of, um, you know, of chemical and big ag. You know, it's going to be Cargill and Smithfield and Monsanto who are paying that guy's camp, you know, who've given millions and millions of dollars over the career of that politician. And he's bought and sold and owned. He is a sock puppet for those companies. Um, the other thing is, I mean, another, uh, another instrument of agency capture is that most people have, when they work for the government for 20 years, their pension matures. And they're going to get a 50% pension, someplace 100% pension for the rest of their lives. Yeah. So at that point, they will often leave the agency and go work for industry and continue. And then they're collecting two salaries. Yeah. The industry has an open door for those people and everybody knows it. And they're going to pay them huge um, bonuses. Mm -hmm. Very, very big. <clears throat> and so when those, those are the people who run the divisions within that regulatory agency. So that's the guy, because he knows, he's he's been there for 20 years. So he knows he's everybody. He's in charge of the division. Right. He's all the relationships. Everybody else in the division is working for him. They take his lead because their salaries all depend on him. He knows that he's preparing the groundwork so that he can have a soft landing at Monsanto or wherever else. He needs to do them a bunch of favors while he's still in office there. And then on the 20th year, he can go over and work for the company. But everybody in that agency is being schooled in that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the whistleblowers get weeded out and they get sent to, you know, offices in Dubuque and where they can't cause any problems. And it's this is an example people, of what you've talked about, which what? is corporate kleptocracy, right? Yeah. Which is this concept that our government's been co-opted in ways that yeah. is scary. When you know, when you talk about it in general, as a oh yeah, the the government is influenced by corporations, you know, you could dismiss it. But when you hear the depth of the discovery that you did with the glyphosate case in Monsanto, all these relationships come out, all these communications come out. And it, it's frightening as a as a citizen to think about who's running the government. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, so, it's not us anymore. No. How do we How do we deal with that? I mean, I, I think the lawsuits, litigation, is this is this the thing that we have to be doing more of in the food industry? I mean, you know, it, that's a bigger question. It's about how do you um, how do you halt the free for all the devolution, which has now become a free fall of democracy into corporate kleptocracy and to ultimately plutocracy? It's the big, you know, the end game that Eisenhower warned us about in on January twenty seven, January seventeenth, nineteen sixty. The military he was industrial leaving complex, office right. and said, you know, the biggest threat to America is not a foreign enemy. It's um, the military industrial complex, which will destroy democracy, which will turn America into a national security state and an imperial country abroad and a national security state at home. And they and essentially transform this model democracy into a plutocracy. And, you know, for 40 years, we've seen this um, systematic attack on the institutions of government, the regulatory agencies, uh, and, the, and the American middle class, the things that really made America a stable democracy. And, mm -hmm. you know, at this point, I, the Citizens United case was probably the biggest 
um, assault on you know on those on the integrity of democratic institutions. So can you talk about what that is? People might not know what is this. What is well, Citizens United? It, Citizens United was was a, we had a law that was written in 1907 that um, made it illegal for corporations to give political campaign contributions to federal officials. And there was a period in American history in the 1880s and 1890s, a period that we know as the Gilded Age, mm. when we really did lose American democracy. Um, America, by the end of the Gilded Age, it had very little claim to being a democracy anymore. It was being run by large trusts, by you know, Standard Oil, by the Oil Trust, the Sugar Trust, the Steel Trust, Morgan, right? the Mellon family, and they all, all were on interlocking boards on the you know on all of these big industries which were monopoly controlled and the railroads, the steel industry, the sugar industry. The and that's what Teddy Roosevelt industry. came and was a trust buster, right? Well, that, what a, a whole bunch of things happened once you had a populist movement which was in the agricultural areas and you had a progressive movement which was in the city and they kind of you know blended which were people who were fighting this takeover of our country by um, by large corporations and then you had muckraking journalists like uh, Sinclair Lewis, Ida Tarbell and Upton Sinclair. Upton Sinclair and many others who came along and who were directly attack informing the American public about a corporate takeover and then you had a very charismatic leader Teddy Roosevelt who came in and who was willing to stand up to them and um, in the first 10 years of the uh, of the 1900s we passed the Sherman Antitrust Act which you know um, which allowed us gave us a tool to reduce the power of corporations we passed a graduated income tax that made wealthy people and corporations for the first time pay their share of the cost of our democracy. Um, we had um, minimum wage laws for the mm -hmm. first time. We had child labor, labor laws. laws yeah. uh, we gave women the vote. Um, we abolished the, uh, you know, there was no direct election of senators. At that point, senators were chosen by the state legislatures who were utterly corrupt. So mm -hmm. they, it gave the capacity it was said about um, that, uh, that in Pennsylvania, none of the members of the state legislature were for sale because they were all owned by Standard Oil and Standard Oil wouldn't sell any of them. Hmm. And Standard Oil could choose whoever was Senator of Delaware, was Senator of Pennsylvania, et cetera, because they control the legislatures. And that yeah. was true in virtually all the states. And so, and then corporations were putting so the, huge amounts of money into the political process. We passed all these laws, but the most important law we passed in terms of reclaiming democracy was a law that was passed in 1907 that, um, that forbade, it prohibited um, contributions by corporations to federal elected officials. Yeah. And a hundred years later, in 2008, you know, the Scalia-Thomas uh, court, the, the court was once again taken over by corporatists who then threw out that law and um, and said, we're going to, you know. And that was Citizens they, they United. Said, what they said was that money was speech. And if you had money. It was free speech. It, it, the First Amendment prohibited anybody <laughs> from telling you who you could give it to and who you couldn't. Wow. And so it basically gave constitutional sanction yeah. to legalize bribery. Wow. You know, it legalized bribery. So that was the beginning of the corruption. And that was, well, that was the beginning of the end. I, I, rem America. I remember uh, I heard Senator McCain talking once, and he's a Republican. He says, you know, until we turn back the tides on Citizens United, we're not going to have a real democracy yeah, anymore. And, you can. and I remember the other thing you told me once, Bobby, was uh, the other big catastrophe in our democracy was the repeal of the Fairness Doctrine. Yeah. And, and so tell people what that is and why it's such a big deal that it was repealed. That was, and let, let me just say another thing, you know, from the beginning of our national history, people, you hear people today saying, you know, the big enemy is big government. And that's true, you know, particularly if government is reading our mail and our emails and, you know, and reading every communication that we have and torturing people and doing all the things that American government now does that it didn't used to do. Yeah. That's scary. 
and putting in 5G everywhere without, you know, anybody being able to object about it. That's a new podcast we'll yeah. do on 5G. Right? So, um, but from the beginning of our national history, um, our most visionary political leaders and beloved political leaders were warning Americans that the biggest threat to democracy and to human rights and civil rights is going to come from corporate power. And that's mm -hmm. why... Um, Thomas Jefferson wanted to illegalize corporate charters because he said, we can't create these entities that are immortal, that yes. have no soul, that have no sense of right or wrong, mm. that are become, gonna become predatory on democracy. Yeah. And then, you know, Andrew Jackson fought against the banks. And now, there was a long history of this. Teddy Roosevelt, who was a Republican, said that America will never be destroyed by foreign enemy but our democracy will be subverted by malefactors of great wealth who would erode it from within um eisenhower and his who was a republican in his greatest speech ever warned americans against the uh the military, you know, the military industrial, industrial complex. complex abraham lincoln the founder of the republican party probably the greatest president in american history mm -hmm said during the height of the Civil War in 1863, I have the South in front of me and I have the bankers behind me and for my country, I fear the bankers more. Wow. And, Te and Franklin Roosevelt said after, um, during, the, during World War II, that the domination of government by corporate power is quote, the essence of fascism. And Benito Mussolini, who had an insider's view of that process, said the same thing. He complained that fascism should not be called fascism. It was corporatism because yeah. it was the it was the merger of state and corporate power. Yeah. And what we have to understand as Americans is that the domination of business by government is called communism. The domination of government by business is called fascism. And, you know, our job is kind of walk that narrow trail in between and keep big government at bay with our left hand, big business at bay with our right. And then, you know, and the only way that we can do that to have real representative democracy, functioning democracy, is if we have an informed public yeah. that can recognize all the milestones of tyranny and that we have an informed, independent press that is speaking truth to power, and we don't have those things. No, I remember seeing that movie Vice about Dick Cheney, and there was a scene in the movie where Roger Ailes was talking to the vice president at the time, George H.W. Bush, and Bush said to him, you know, we're talking about the fairness doctrine to get that repealed and fix that, and that was the birth yeah. of Fox News, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and the end of, of independent, fair media, the end yeah. of... While the Walter Cronkite era, where you could actually listen right. and wasn't just a bunch of nonsense. And now, out there. you know, uh, if they, even the network news and CNN and, and Fox are all, you know, run by corporations. I mean, it was right? terrifying. I mean, about you me. look at the look at the advertisements for 5G for the farm by the pharmaceutical industry by the oil industry the food industry and the, I mean I was and I was the food more, industry, and they're not going to you know though Anderson Cooper is not going to bite the hand that feeds him I mean I was mortified I was I was in the green room uh, I was about to go on TV in Washington yesterday and I saw Good Morning America and they were serving Wendy's breakfast sandwiches to the entire audience they were munching down them on television they had a big ad afterwards for Wendy's and I'm like this is what our democracy has come yeah. to and our news has come to. It's really terrible. Well, Bobby, you are such a wealth of knowledge, of history. Uh, you've really enlightened us about this whole glyphosate story and how important it is that we actually litigate to actually bring awareness and to create discovery for these companies to show what they're really doing. And I think you're, you're just a real hero in my mind, Bobby, that you're telling the truth, speaking truth to power, and uh, getting these companies to be accountable for their bad behavior and we need more people like you out there doing this because uh, I think our democracy is at stake and uh, and I really thank you for all you're doing Bobby thank you thanks well, Mark for everything you do you're my hero <laughs> thanks Bobby is that uh, Red Bull that you have in that no cup? it's not Red Bull it's water <laughs> it's a tea so thank you for listening to Doctors Pharmacy I hope you enjoyed this conversation uh, if you love this podcast please share with your friends and family leave a comment we'd love to hear from you subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and we'll see you next week on the Doctors pharmacy.